So thank you for joining me today. The topic today is a, we're going to create a 360 degree escape room. So as many of you know, you've probably seen some of the hype in the past week. Um, yeah, Storyline released 360 degree image capabilities, and it's actually um, better than I expected it to be. It's pretty good. Um, you know, maybe not something you use on every project, hopefully not, but there will be some good use cases. Um, I imagine we, we can go ahead and check out the functionality together. I know some of you have been waiting for this session to really dive into it. We'll check out the functionality and then we will um, see if we can get some good ideas from the chat about, about where to go with the escape room. So I'll get us started. And I know we have some escape room en enthusiasts in the chat, so um, it will be fun. I have a couple of images for us that you can go ahead and download. So let me go ahead and share those with you. So I just shared two image files for you to download an image of a room and an image of a city. These aren't very high quality images or anything, but they should get the job done for this project. And then also, I, I guess I want to I want to show you like where you can source some of these images, since you may be using these in projects of your own. Um, and we can also talk about when it makes sense to use this functionality on a real project, but. Here we are. So I got these images from this site right here. It's pixxid.com. Uh, all of these were like free images. So these are good ones to play around with if you want to try creating a, a quick 360 project of your own. Um, but I just looked up 360 panoramic. So this is where I got the room and then I got, and this is the city image. So if you're watching the recording on YouTube or something, you can just grab these if you'd like to follow along. But in my research, and while I was looking for some good sites, I also came across this, 360cities.net. And this one had some pretty good um, images. So for example, if we just look up city here, it's pretty cool. We can just like dive into any of these. The, the downside about these is that they aren't free. And it takes a minute to load up, but, but yeah, with this new Storyline update, you can bring an image like this right into Storyline with this same kind of functionality, and we can add interactivity to it. This site was the most impressive, airpano.com. Again, these are some pricey licenses, I think, like a few hundred dollars for a single image. But if you're using this for like an actual, you know, project for your company or, or for educational purposes and you have a budget, you can find some really nice images. <laughs> um, and then finally, I think the most common use would be to use a 360 degree camera, something like this, um, the Theta 360. There are a bunch of different models. This is like their um, highest end one. But you just put this on a stand and it will take like a full 360 degree image. And then you can go ahead and do like business walkthroughs or, um, you know, home walkthroughs, like whatever makes sense for a project. And I think that's where this would really shine and make sense um, on real projects. Yeah, that, that one I just showed you cost like $1,000, but they have, you, they have 360 degree ca cameras for like a few hundred dollars. Um, I don't think Storyline has any 360 degree images in their content library yet, but maybe that's something they would do. Um, yeah, so that's where we can source our images from. And then, you know, I'm sure there are other ways to do it too, but that was just in my research for this project. Um, before I get into it, like Kath Ellis, I know most of you know her. She also did a live stream yesterday showing how you can edit 360 degree images. So you could, you could literally create a 360 degree scene from scratch and then put us in the center of it in Storyline. That's a bit more complex, but there are tons of tutorials on YouTube. Um, but yeah, check out Kath Ellis's video. She shows you how to edit these images in Photoshop before bringing them into Storyline. Oh, and Lawrence said Shutterstock also does 360 degree images. So there are some good, some good options out there for us. But I think most of us are probably ready to dive into Storyline, so... We should go ahead and get started with that. Um, and for the people who aren't hearing or seeing anything, if you can just suggest that they maybe try a new browser in the chat, um, I think we can get everyone in here. And, and again, if you do want to follow along, we're going to open up Storyline and dive in right now. But um, you can also follow along with the recording you'd like. This will be on YouTube like probably right after the session today. So here we are. This may look familiar to most of you. Um, I just created a new project in Storyline, and now we can double click on this slide to go into slide view here. 
you know, we have some housekeeping items. If you've ever attended any of these storyline workshops, the first thing we want to do is go ahead and change this to a widescreen 16 uh, 9 layout. So I'll go to the design tab at the top. We'll go to story size, and then I will just change this to 16 9. We'll just leave it as 960 by 540. Not a big deal for what we're doing today. But there we go. We have this wider screen view going on. And then the other thing we want to do is get rid of the player, um, just so we don't have like the menu and the seek bar and all of that stuff that we don't really need for this project. So I'm going back to the home tab. We're going to go to player. And then we can go ahead and turn menus and controls off. And one last little touch just to make it kind of blend in better with the background. We'll go to colors and effects and we can change it to light mode. So I'll press OK. And if you didn't do those things because you were opening, opening up Storyline, it's not a big deal. It's just like little minor changes. Um, let me bring the chat to a new window. OK. So we're doing well. Mo, I'll share the I'll share the session to Kath Ellis. It's it's on her YouTube channel. You can just look up Kath Ellis on YouTube and you will find that session. But here we are in Storyline. The first thing I want to do is let's go ahead and add those images that I shared with you. So on oh and and another thing, make sure your Storyline is like completely up to date. If you don't see this option in the Insert tab, you see I go to Insert and then 360 degree image beta. If you don't see that, it just means you haven't updated your um, Storyline program. All right, so we will select that. We want to insert the 360 degree image and we will insert this escape room image first. Sarah, I just clicked on 16.9 for the slide dimensions. But here we go. So you see this looks a little bit different than we're used to seeing. Um, we only see a little part of that image, whatever would fit in the view at one time. And then there's an option to edit that image. So, I mean, we can just preview it just so you can see. It's just like what we were seeing in the browser on those 360 degree websites. We can go ahead and spin around and see the whole scene now. So I'm just clicking and dragging. This is our room that I guess we will be escaping from. And I'm going to let you guys know where I'm going with this and, and we'll see um, if anyone has any creative recommendations about where we'll introduce the interactivity. But let's, let's build the building blocks first. So we added this image. I'm just going to title this slide. So I'll double click on 1.1 over here on the left, and I will just call this like room. Um, I'll also save my project so that we don't lose it if Storyline crashes or something. So we'll go File, Save As, and then I'll just save it on my desktop, and we'll call it um, 360 Testing, or we'll call it Escape Room. And if, if you just joined, you can actually download these images from the handouts tab right here in the, the platform that you're on. Thank you, Autumn. OK, so we saved our project. We're going to name our scene. These are just storyline housekeeping items. Let's double. I, I clicked on this story view up here, and I'll double click on the scene name where it says untitled scene, and we will just call this escape room. OK. We'll double click back into the slide. I want to create a new slide now. I want to use that second image. So I'm going to, to right click on this slide, mouse over new slide, mouse over basic layouts, and then select blank to add a blank slide. Nick, I don't think there's a way to full screen since storyline is like a fixed aspect ratio. But when you do open this in a browser, it will expand to fill the screen real estate that you have available. But OK, so I'm going to name this slide city. And now we're going to just insert that second 360 degree image in the insert tab and we'll insert that times square panorama and these these videos aren't or these images aren't super high quality again i got these for free off of uh, that site i showed you so if you're paying for images you can get something looking really really crisp or if you have like a nice 360 degree camera but here we go. So we've added these images. Let me again, let's let's explore like the building blocks too for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to play around with this by yourself. So notice what I did. I just went to a slide with a 360 degree image and that we can select edit right in the center. Pretty self-explanatory.
So once we select edit image, it should open up here. Yeah, Nick, with some JavaScript, it probably, I mean, anything's possible with JavaScript, right? <laughs> but at that point, you could use a library like A-Frame or something, where you can just use HTML to build experiences like this. Um, and you can just launch that from Storyline if you need tracking or something. But we digress, we digress. So here we are. So we have a couple of options for interactivity within an image like this. And you will see those right up here, marker and hotspot, OK? So marker, it's kind of like the markers you would add in Storyline otherwise if you've used like 2D Storyline. <laughs> um, so there we go. We can just select marker and then we click anywhere in this image. And now we have this nice little marker here that we can, we can change its appearance. For example, say we want to have like this little map icon, this location icon, we can change it to that. We can change the accent color if we'd like. And it, it by default, it has a label. So like, I am a marker. Select me. OK, so that's a marker. I don't think we're going to really be using those today. Um, and, and there are like little animations it can do as well. Um, see, like you can pulse them if they haven't been visited before in this interaction tab. You know, just explore these tabs. There's, there's not a whole lot to digest. And Storyline does have documentation about this. but. Um, I'm just going to delete this. So I guess I could show you what it looks like. Um, but you can also add hotspots. So if you're familiar with, if you've used Storyline before, these are things that you add to add like an invisible layer of interactivity over another object. So for example, if I want to make it so that when you select this TV, it does something, I can draw a hotspot over it. And for each one of these markers and hotspots, you can add a label and or a trigger. And you can see that here. So the label is this part that's coming up that's coming up where it wants you to enter a title and enter a body. Right? So we can add the labels, but we can also add the triggers, and that's where we we see the interactivity. So I can add a trigger here just by clicking on trigger, and I can make it so that it will jump to the next slide when the user clicks this hotspot. Okay, so it won't show up like cyan like this in the view. Let's view it and see see what it's like here. Okay, so here we are. So, so that's that pulsing if unvisited. You see how this marker is pulsing like that? If we select it, there we go. It's not pulsing anymore. And because we have this like pulsing feature turned on for the hotspot, it's, it's showing us that there's something there as well. And if we click it, it's gonna try to bring us to the next slide, all right? So we don't really want all of this going on. We don't want the pulsing because if, if we're designing an escape room, it's going to be too easy if it's like, oh, yeah, look at me over here. Click on me and I'm going to do something. We don't want to make it that obvious. Maybe we can do some pulsing ones to like distract people. <laughs> but I think we're going to want to get rid of that. So I'm going to go to the interaction tab up here at the top. And we're going to click on hotspots. And now you see this. There are these two checked um, options right here, reveal hotspots and pulse hotspots if unvisited. We don't want to reveal the hotspots. We're going to keep this kind of tricky. Like you're, They're going to have to really explore this room. So let's click on reveal hotspots so that they do not get revealed. So we don't want those selected. So that's good. The marker, we don't really need the marker. We can remove this. OK. So these are the building blocks we have so far. We have hotspots. So that when someone clicks on something or hovers something, it does something else. Uh, so that's how we're introducing interactivity to these 360 degree images. Like I said, or OK, so you notice how when we move this scene around, like the hotspot stays over this TV. What we cannot do, which I would have really liked if we could do, is if we could add like a shape, for example, if we could add our own custom shapes and graphics that could be situated within this scene. Because if we could do that, then we can manipulate the states of those shapes and objects within the scene. So like when you click on the TV, we can make something else appear around the room. We can't do that yet. Storyline doesn't have that interactivity added. It seems like all we would need to do is add like an option to add an image or a shape, just like, or text. All of, if only we had all of the same options we have on the base version of the slide, we would be able to do a lot more interesting things with this functionality. But already, like I said, I'm impressed. I thought it would just be like you can view a 360 image, but it does let us add some interactivity.
And this is where I will shout out again Kath's um, session here. So let me let me play this and show you what Kath did in Photoshop. So this is Kath's like studio that she's building um, on her property. So that's she just took this photo herself. But this TV she added in Photoshop. And then when we look behind us, so she also added like kitchen. So you can like label rooms and and you know add your own elements, just like I was talking about in Storyline, but you have to do it in Photoshop. And in this tutorial here from Kath Ellis, uh, she talks about how to do that. So if you are doing a serious project, like you're probably going to want to modify your images in some way before bringing them into Storyline. The only problem is we can't make that interactive. Like in Storyline, we can't make it so that when you hover over a kitchen, it like glows or something. I wish we could. And if anyone has any creative ideas about how that may be possible, definitely let us know. But, um, but this is good. So let's bring this further along. Um, here, I'll, I'll tell you my, my, my concept and, or, or no, there's one more building block. So while we can't add elements to this scene, what we can do is we can show elements on top of this scene. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's go ahead and press save and close. Save and close, sorry. Um, so now it's just like a normal slide. So at the slide view level, this could, this could essentially be a static image. Like the slide itself doesn't really differentiate between 360 and not 360. It isn't until we go into that edit mode that we really see the 360 functionality. So what we can do is I'm going to add a layer. So, you know, for those of you who are familiar with story with the Adobe suite, but new to storyline layers are the same concept We're just stacking things on top of what we have here on the base layer. And we can do that with this new layer um, button down here in the bottom, right? So we're going to select a new layer and we will just call this, um, challenge or something. Okay. I created a new layer called challenge and I want this to appear when the user does something in this escape room. So I'm going to insert just a shape. So insert tab, we're going to shape and then we're going to rectangle. Now I'll just draw a rectangle. Um, I'm going to go to the format tab now and I'm going to, I want this rectangle to be perfectly centered on the screen. So I'm going to use this align center button right here in the arrange and align section. And then I'm going to use align middle. Now it's perfectly centered. Um, we also want to change the color. So I'm going to go to shape fill and select that little drop down arrow. We'll go to more fill colors. I'm just going to do one F one F one F. It's like a close to black color. And then finally, I want to remove the outline. So I'm going to press the drop down next to shape outline and press no outline. Okay, so this is like a tool tip that's going to appear and we'll have some text appear on top of that. So like, um, what is the answer? And the text is black. So I'm going to highlight that I'm going to use, um, I'm going to change the text color to white using this little font color option right here. I can change the font size to like 40. I'm going to change the font to Futura and this you won't have, I, I have this through Typekit, so feel free to use like Arial, Open Sans, any font you like. Um, and now I'll just want some sort of button to like close this or answer whatever this question would be. And we don't know what this will be yet. We're going to talk about it. So for now, this will just say like return. I'm going to make the fill color of this button a different color and Let's make the text a, a bit different as well. Um, okay, so this isn't the cutest thing in the world, <laughs> um, but, it, but I just want to show you what we're working with. So what we want to do is when someone clicks on this return button, we want to hide this layer and make it disappear. So when the user clicks that, we're going to hide the layer, this layer, when the user clicks rectangle two. And now we need to, we need to show this layer at some point. So let's edit this image. Um, and let's imagine, okay, if someone selects like the camera, we want to show this specific layer. So how we would do that, of course, is with this, the hotspot feature, these little invisible, um, detectors for interactivity. So we're going to click on hotspot. And now when the user clicks on this, um, we don't want to label, 
So notice by default, it adds a label to all of these hotspots. So up here in the hotspot um, menu, I'm going to click on label to remove that. And I'm going to click on trigger to add a trigger. Okay. So we don't want to hide a layer. We want to show layer a challenge when the user clicks on this hotspot. All right, I'm going to catch up on the chat and let everyone get a chance to get caught up on this if you are trying to follow along. Basically, making a layer, um, whenever someone selects a hotspot within the 360 degree image, we're going to show that layer. And then there's an option on that layer to hide the layer and return to the full 360 image. And yeah, if you're just hopping in here, um, this will be on YouTube right, right after the session. And I'm sure there are people, and it looks like there are people in here who are helping you get uh, brought up to speed. Okay, so now this functionality should work. We should be able to see that layer whenever we select the camera. So let's check this out. I'm gonna save and close, and now we will preview by selecting this desktop preview icon in the top right. So here we are, and notice it says two items at the bottom. This is because we had progress tracking turned on. We're going to turn this off, but I just wanted you to see like another another aspect of this functionality so there there's like a progress meter and it will tell you how many of the things you've accessed and how many more you need to access but right now we're not giving any hints so let's look at this camera Note, notice when our mouse goes over a hot spot it does turn into this like pointer so that is a subtle change that could give away like it, it gives away which parts of this scene are interactive um so there well, there are multiple options of how we could address that if we don't want to like give away this hint, but we could talk about that later if we want to. But let's click on the camera. So now you see that layer comes up. So if I click out here on the side, notice I can still like use the 360 scene, but if I mouse over the layer, it's kind of just like blocking your mouse from the 360 part. Like I can't click and drag on this and it moved the image. But if I click return, it brings us back into the scene. Okay. Um, I'm seeing some people are saying the video blur is blurry. I'm going to add a poll question just so we can see where everyone is at with that. Because again, it is the first time I'm using this platform. We have over 300 people here live. I want to know how the, how the platform is handling this. Is my screen blurry is the question. All right, I just shared a poll if you could answer that. If the screen's blurry, not blurry, or somewhat blurry. Oh, wow, this is looking good. OK, cool. Looks like for most of us, we're not having any issues. Um, but yeah, the nature of streaming video to this live of an audience seems like it won't be perfect. Um, and it may be poor internet connection. So if, if it's un, if it's too blurry to follow, feel free to catch the um, the recording after this or just hang out in the chat and listen to what we're doing. But I, I am sorry. I just, I don't know if there's much I can do on my end about that at this point. But okay, so these are the building blocks. So I'm, I think I'm gonna call on our escape room experts here. We have a lot of different objects in here, right? My, my idea is like eventually you'll be able to like select this TV to like make it out of this room and you wind up here in the city scene. So we already have that functionality. So I'm going to preview the entire project. So like if we try to do this before we like do something else in the room, I want it to be like, oh, there's like a weird energy emanating from the TV or something, but it doesn't actually do anything. But then if we click up, but then once we like, I don't know, like open this drawer and like find a code and then enter the code in like the computer over here or something, then the TV will like unlock and then we can click on it and it brings us here into the city and we could add little like speech bubbles from these people. I mean, we're only here for another 33 minutes. Uh, maybe I can hang out a little later if we're, we don't wrap up in time, but, but let's see if we have any like, creative ideas about what, what we can interact with or have to do in this room in order to, to unlock the TV and like make it out of this room. A quiz on the TV to ask for the right code. True, there could be a quiz somewhere, but maybe we should like make it more complicated. Like maybe, the, maybe we access the quiz another way. 
but that would be a good way to bring a learning spin into this. I think we should have some sort of question that seems smart. <laughs> All right, I'm just reading the chat to see if we have some good ideas about, about what to do here. Turn on the computer first. Okay, okay, what about when we, when we try to um, access the TV, it like ask, asks us for like a, like a four digit code to unlock it. So we can have like a layer where it's like, what is the code for, the, for this? That will get us into a little bit of complexity with like variables, I think, so that will be good. Um, we don't have a timer, Lucy, but that is definitely something we could add to this. Find numbers for the code by clicking around each hot and each hotspot has one. That, that's true. Um, okay. Okay. I like where this is going. I am trying to keep in mind we have 30 minutes, so we would, we would have to move fast, but we could do, we could do something like that. Like imagine if like, yeah, you, you, act, okay. Well, let's see if we have any ideas, any more ideas, because that one's possible, but it will be, um, it will get a little bit tricky. Enter the time on the clock on the shelf. We could even like validate that they entered the right time with JavaScript, but like, I don't think that's what people are here for. Open the drawer to find a remote control to turn on the TV. Okay. Okay. I like that. That's like logical. Like if we open like this drawer over here. And you see what I mean about wishing we could like can add objects within this image. Like if we could just add like a rectangle here that like a black rectangle to make the TV look off. And then when they like open this drawer and find the remote, we can like hide that rectangle. That would just take the functionality of this like even further. Um, hopefully that's on the roadmap for this 360 uh, functionality. Uh, Robbie mentions that he would love to see the number of clicks a user has in the room. So Robbie, there actually is, there's something else I want to draw attention to. We might as well talk about it now. Every time you create one of these 360 degree images, it adds two variables to your project. So let's check this out. 360 image one total items and 360 image one visited items. So it, so it knows how many different interactive elements we've added to each one of these images. And then it also will keep track of how many of those items we access. So in this, in this view right here, oh wait, let's edit 360 image. So right now that variable that like total, um, what is it called again? Total items is two. So this is an item and this is an item. So once we visit both of them, the visited items will be equal to two. So we can keep track of like how many things they're interacting with, maybe not so much how many clicks they're doing on nothing, but we will know, okay, they viewed one out of three things or whatever it is. Okay. Okay. Let's, I think, I think we have enough to run with. Um, I think we have enough to run with. How about we do this? How about we make it so that the remote to the TV is hidden in this drawer, but we have to find the code to open this drawer somewhere else. Maybe we find the code in a book on, on this bookshelf. Okay. I think, I think that should be manageable. Okay, let's do it. So I guess we could start with this in a, a few different ways. Let's start by making our layers. Okay. So this one's called challenge. Let's call this one, um, the code. Okay. So I'm, this text is going to be too big. Let's make this size like 22. Um, so this is what people will see when they, when they pick up one of those books on the bookshelf. Okay. After spending a few minutes, um, going through the books on the bookshelf. I'm just going to drag this in a bit so that it wraps within the box. After spending a few minutes going through the books on the bookshelf, um, an, in, uh, an index card um, falls from one of the books. It has a four digit code on it. Um, six, zero, nine, or eight, two. Okay. Okay. 
So there we go. So this, is, so we want to open this whenever someone clicks on one of those books. Um, now, what do we want to happen when they open the drawer? So we, we need to ask them for the code. Um, to, so a drawer is locked. Okay, so I think I'm just going to copy this exact setup. So I just clicked on one item, hold, held down the shift key on my keyboard and selected these other items. Then I press control C. And now I'm going to go to this new layer that I created and just press control V to paste it. So this, so this time we want to say, um, you try to open the drawer, but it's locked. There's a small keypad to enter a four digit code. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat just to make sure everyone's following. But here we go. So now we need to add a text entry input so that the, the, the person can enter um, that code. And we can use a text entry or a number entry. Why don't we just do that? So we'll go to the insert tab. We will go to input above interactive objects in this section over here towards the right. And then we will select numeric entry field. Okay, so I'm going to select that. You can, you can click anywhere on the screen to add that. I'm going to try to put it in alignment with this text. And we can do some styling here. I just zoomed in by holding down the control key on my keyboard and zooming in with my um, scroll wheel on my mouse. It, by default, these have like some kind of strange gradient to them. I'm going to go to the format tab, go to shape fill, and then make the shape fill white. Um, shape outline, maybe we can make it blue. I don't know if that's really necessary. I'm going to make it the same width as this button just to keep our alignment going strong. Notice when I click in here that the, uh, the, the what do we call this? Like the cursor or whatever goes, goes to the top. Um, I want this to be centered in the, in the middle of this text entry box. So I'm going to right click the edge, like the border of this text entry box. I'm going to go to format shape. I'm going to go to text box all the way at the bottom. And this is where we can get the alignment options. So notice for the text, the vertical alignment by default is top. We want to change this to middle. Okay, so now when I press close, now notice that this is right here in the center. It's equal white space above and below um, the cursor. Thank you for those of you sharing your expertise in the chat. Sounds like there's some cool convos going on about scavenger hunts and escape rooms. But um, for those of you who are following along, you know, feel free to speak up if you have any questions and we'll make sure you get up to speed. I'm just going back to the format tab, changing the weight outline a bit here, just so we can have a little bit more of a blue glow. Um, so this is pretty simple, but this will be fine, okay? We could, we could obviously add more like direction, like enter the code or something like that, but I'm making another button, so I'm just I'm just clicking on the return button. I'm dragging while holding down the shift key, and um, when I let go, before I let go, I hold down the control key to make a copy. Okay, so you've, if you've been to many of these storyline sessions, that's a pattern I use a lot. I click, I start dragging, I hold down shift to constrain the um, to make sure it's aligned, and then I hold down control before letting it go. It makes a copy. All right, so we want this one to say return and hide the layer. And let's say that this one is submit. Okay. Um, now, you know, for those of you who are very new to Storyline, this wouldn't be a true Storyline workshop with Devlin if you don't get confused a little bit because we get, we range from beginner stuff to advanced stuff. We're going to, we need to use some variables here. Um, I know a lot of you have probably used these, but if not, don't be too alarmed. How these text entry boxes work, look, notice this, when I click on this, there's a trigger associated with it. Set numeric entry equal to the typed value when the user leaves focus from this. So when they click off of it or click submit, it's gonna change this variable called numeric entry equal to whatever the user entered here. Okay, so I'm gonna change the name of that variable by going to the variable manager in the top right here. Okay, so I'm gonna click on that. And here's that numeric entry variable. I want to change the name of this and name it, um, we'll just name it like pin or like code, 
Okay, pass code. So here we go. So now we have this code variable. Now, when the user clicks submit, okay, so, so I, I wanna create some prompts. So here's what I wanted to do. If they press submit and it's the wrong code, I wanna say that code was incorrect. So we'll just add like a warning message right here on this layer, like you entered the incorrect code, okay? But if they get it right, I want to have something else show up where it's like um, the, the, the drawer unlocks and you find a remote control inside or something like that. Okay. So we're going to, first I want to just like make sure we have the layer. So let's say um, unlocked successfully. Oops. I made a new layer. This layer is called unlocked successfully. I'm just going to copy and paste these items again, since we already like built that layout once. So um, the drawer clicks open and you find a remote control inside. What? Um, press it if you dare. Um, it would be fun if we had like a remote con or um, hold on. Press the remote, and then we want to like press the power button. Power button, if you dare. Sorry, my mouse is like getting a little laggy, it appears. Okay, there we go. All right, so here's what we can do now that we have this layer. So when the user pressed the submit button, here's what we're going to do. So I'm gonna open up the trigger. So notice first I click on the submit button. Now it will, show, it will highlight the triggers that are associated with that. I'm going to double click on this trigger that's highlighted to open it up in this trigger wizard. And the action, we don't want to hide the layer. We want to show a layer um, called unlock successfully whenever the user clicks rectangle two, but we only want to do this if, and this is where conditions come into play. So variables and conditions, those go hand in hand. So we wanna show the unlock successfully layer when the user clicks this submit button, if the code is equal to the value, and this is the value that we, we gave away. What was it like 6082? So now that we have this condition, the only time it will actually show this layer when the user clicks this is if they entered 6082 in that numeric entry field. Okay. So I'm going to press okay here. And let's say that it's, that it's not that. So I'm going to copy and paste this trigger. So while it's highlighted, I'm going to press this copy button right here, and then we will just paste it on the same object. I will double click the, the second trigger to open it back up. And we are going to, actually, we, we didn't create the object for that yet. So we're just going to leave it as is for now. And we need to create a new text box. So I'm going to use the trick that I use where I like drag and drop a text box. I hold down the control key so that when I let go, it makes a copy. And I'm going to say um, that code was not correct. Try again. And we can probably make this a bit smaller. So let's make it like size 12. Whoops. I'm going to make this the color red. And I guess we can actually move this up like, or I guess we could put it right here next to it. So we are covering a lot of ground here because we're gonna to need to use states as well. So we don't want this to appear just by default anytime someone loads up this layer. We only want it to appear if someone tr tries submitting the wrong code. So to do that, we're going to select the text box. We're going to go to the states tab down here at the bottom, and we're going to set the initial state to hidden. Okay, so now it will not appear by default. And at this point, we can click on the submit button again. We have these two, do, you know, the two of the same exact trigger. We can double click on the second one now. And we don't want to show a layer this time. We want to change the state of something. 
So we're going to change the state of this text box to to normal when the user clicks this submit button if the code is not equal to 6082. Whoops. So you see how we did that? Um, Sarah asked, so I didn't put this message on a new layer. Yeah, I didn't put it on a new layer just because, you know, maybe they'll want to like try to brute force it. I'm going to guess a million things until I get it right. You know, this is just to kind of show like you need to find this code somewhere in the room. And, and we could have done it on a new, um, a new layer and then like just returned back to this screen. It doesn't matter. There, we have options here. But so you see how I did this? This is how you use variables and conditions and conjunctions. So if we are making a conditional action, usually you'll have a trigger for each condition, you know, for each potential truth, let's say. So the only truth we're concerned about are, you know, is like, is the code equal to 6082? If it is, jump to the successful layer. If it's not, show this error code. The initial state should be hidden because it wouldn't really make sense for it to say the code was not correct try again before we even entered anything. So maybe we should try this and see if um, this is working so far. So let's see if we have our, let's like, since, since we're getting closer to the end and some people might need to drop out in 15 minutes, let's like go back into the 360 programming and see how we can actually start making this interactive. And just to recap, we want to make it so that when someone selects the, the little books on the bookshelf, we show them this layer. And when they select the drawer, we show them this layer. So I'm going to go back to the base layer by selecting room down here at the bottom. And we will edit the 360 degree image. OK, so now we are going to find what we're looking for here. Um, there are the little books. So let's add a hotspot for those. OK, so I'm just going to draw this rectangle. And you have pretty fine control over the handles. Like, it doesn't have to be a rectangle. You can kind of, it's like a free form four point shape here. So I'm going to get rid of the label, like we did before, just by clicking on label. And I'm going to add a trigger. So we want to show a layer um, the code when the user clicks on this hotspot three. OK, and we can rename these things. Like, if I click on this. I just clicked on those three little dots, and now I can rename it from Hotspot 3 to Books. And finally, we want to also add a little hotspot for the drawer when someone tries to open that drawer. Oh, and you can like kind of just draw it yourself too. Cool. All right, so notice I drew that one point by point. So we will name this one um, Drawer. Oh, you actually have to double click on it. I think I just, you just double click on one of these to rename it. Yeah, that's how you rename. Double click on the name um, over here on the left. So for the drawer, we want to add a trigger. And we want to show layer drawer is locked when the user clicks drawer. OK. So this should work now. So let's save and close. Or we can save and close. And now we will, or let me just save the file too so that we don't lose this progress. And now we will preview. OK, so here we are. So let's say, let's open this drawer. Oh no, the drawer is locked. Who would have ever known? It's a four-digit code. So let's try 1299. We will submit. Uh-oh, the code was not correct. Clearly, we need to do some more searching. So we will return, we'll look around. OK, we, we have a really strong feeling there's something hidden in these books. So we will select those. And what do we know? We found an index card with the code on it. Uh, so 6082, we will return. Let's go back to this drawer, see if we can get it opened up. We will do 6082. We will submit. The drawer clicks open. What a surprise. We found a remote. Press the power button if you dare. OK, so that is, that is the basic workflow here. These are the tools we have at our disposal to, to work with 360 degree images like this. You have to kind of use these like 2D overlays to really change states, add text, uh, do all of that fun stuff. Otherwise, we're just changing between different 360 degree images. But we can look at a couple of more things. Notice it still had at the bottom like two of four visited and all of that. We don't want that. 
So I'm going to go back into editing this image. I'm going to uncheck show progress indicator. And that's how we get rid of those little like two out of three, two out of four. Um, yeah, a lot of potential. Hopefully you're seeing like with these building blocks, you can do a lot of, of really cool things in here. Um, but let's do a little bit more. I mean, if is there a way to remove the incorrect code? Yeah, we can do that. I will show you exactly how. But I think there is something else I wanted to do in here. Um, well, let, let me show you how to do that for now, though. So this is this is based on the timeline. So notice when we came back here, it kind of still it showed this and showed our old code. If we select the the layer um, options down here, the layer properties, I'm all the way down in the bottom right. I don't know if you can see me. Let's do screen share only. So with this little cog wheel, you click on that, and now we can, for allow seeking, let's reset, or no, sorry, for when revisiting, let's reset to initial state. So that should do the trick. I think that it will. It may keep the old code. Um, it actually may not be enough, yeah. But the way we would remove that, so here's the other piece. So, so notice it's setting this code variable to whatever we type in there. That variable is going to stay equal to whatever we typed in until we change it back to something different. Okay, so what we would do is I'm going to create a new trigger. I'm going to um, adjust a variable. Okay, so I'm going to set this code variable to. Well, I don't know if zero will like show a zero in there, if it will just be blank. Um, but we'll experiment with this. It would definitely work with the text entry variable because you could you could have that blank. But we're going to set that code to zero when the user clicks on rectangle three return. So when they click on return, that will be like a reset for the code. It will set it back to zero, um, and, and that should do the trick there. But what we can do, so check this out. Uh, well, we don't have that much more time. There's so much more fun stuff we could do. Let's just, I guess, let's try to finish up like this core interaction we've had. Um, and then we can see if we have time to, to do some more fun things in this. So once we press the remote, we're going to want something to happen. So we'll add another prompt. So TV um, turns on. Okay. So now let's, we're going to copy and paste this. Uh, so it's pasted here. Um, the TV turns on and emits an inviting glow. All right. So here we go. This isn't going to be perfect. I'm just trying to, I don't know, make these a little bit more balanced, but it is what it is. The TV turns on. So when we press this button, we want to not hide a layer, but we want to show a layer. Um, TV turns on. And notice you can just also adjust uh, trigger settings right here in this triggers panel on the right side of the screen. Can we pop a video on the TV? I don't think we can, because like I was saying earlier, you can't really add any like media within the 360 view. So if you try to add a video and just like put it over that screen, it, would, it wouldn't follow the room. It would just be like static on your screen, just like these are static on your screen. Because you can't add any kind of media inside of this 360 view, if that makes sense. But okay, so we need to do one more thing. So right now, if you notice, so check this out. So when we click on the TV, we're jumping to the next slide. So we need a condition because if someone clicks on the TV right when they get in here, they're going to make it out of the escape room and without ever entering any code or doing any exploring. So we need to add a condition. And of course, to do that, I'm going to create a variable. So I'm going to select the variable manager here. We're going to press the green plus icon to create a new one. And we will call this one is TV turned on. And it will be false by default because the TV isn't on until we press that power button on the remote. So now what we can do, well, first I want to get rid of this label because we didn't do that earlier. So we don't want the label, but we will double click on the trigger. And the condition here will be this. We will only jump to that next slide when the user clicks this hotspot. If is TV turned on is equal to true. Okay. And of course, we can do something else if this TV turned on is equal to false. We can create a new layer that says the TV is emitting a strange glow, but it won't, it won't turn on. It's frozen or something like that. 
Um, but we don't have that layer set up, so we will not do that right now. And return hides this. So And so we need to make that true at some point. And this is a great slide to do that on. So once we get this message that the TV turns on, we're going to create a new trigger. We are going to adjust a variable. This time we're adjusting the is TV turned on variable and we are setting it to true. And not when the user clicks, but just when the timeline starts on this layer. So at this point, it turns to true and we're good to go. One more thing, just I wanna show you something else we can, we can modify. So notice we keep starting just looking at this like lamp here. We can go to interaction and you notice in the top left here, it has this initial view option. So with the interaction tab, we'll, go, we'll click on edit next to initial view. And notice now we can like put the camera exactly where we want it to start us um, when we get into this scene. So we'll just point him in the right direction, right? So then you press set. And now this is our new initial view. We're not gonna be looking in like the corner over there. So I'll save and close and this whole thing should work now. So here we go, we're going to preview the entire project and let's see how this goes. Okay, so here we are. So this TV looks inviting, we click on it, nothing happens. It kind of like shows us, okay, there's a hotspot here. Um, but since we have that, that condition where it only does something if that variable is true, it doesn't do anything right now. We saw how this functioned, we know the code but we'll, we'll look at it again, 6082. We'll open this drawer. Oh yeah, see, so it did set it to zero. So we would have to use a text entry box to actually get that to reset to nothing because it looks like it doesn't let you set the numeric just to like nothingness. Um, with, with a text entry box, it would just set it equal to like a space, for example, and it would look like nothing. But we'll do 6082. Here we go, we find the remote, we turn on the power, now let's enter this wonderful world of Times Square. Here we are. All right, how are we feeling about this? Um, and notice we can we can do, you know, we can have fun with this. Like I can just, we can keep copying this and we can be like, um, hallway. Like um, you try to leave the room, but a force field pulls you back towards the center. So we can show this layer um, when the user tries to like go through that doorway there. And again, so see all I'm using are hotspots. Okay, we don't want the label, we do want the trigger, show layer, um, hallway when the user clicks the hotspot. So, so yeah, I think you all get the idea. Okay, so, so Irina is asking a good question. So we're thinking, what kind of content will this be best for? So uh, we, we talked about it a, a, a bit in the beginning. This obviously doesn't have a lot of learning value. I guess if you really wanted to like do something different, you could create an escape room like this. And like, you know, to, to unlock the drawer, you need to like answer this multiple choice question. Basically just like a really like kind of higher production value of like a quiz, probably not necessary, may have some like novelty factor, um, but probably not amazing for like learning gains. I think where it really shines is when we want to like immerse people in a specific space. So imagine like onboarding training where I'm taking something from the office and you're showing me here's what it's like going to be like to be on site. Here are these different like, here's the different equipment that will be on site that you can mouse over and like learn more about this equipment. Um, and maybe if you're touring like a, a facility of some sorts, um, tours, yeah, exactly. Tours are really good because you can click on one of the doors. So yeah, check out Kath Ellis's video because she kind of showed off this functionality. There's like two rooms to the studio. And when you click on one room, it like brings you into the second one and you can move around the second one. So you can literally recreate like a whole, yeah, virtual field trip ideas, good ideas. Pick out the hazards in health and safety training. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Like, yeah, we're like analyzing this scene that's going to look exactly like our workspace and we need to kind of highlight the areas that are hazards. That's a good idea. Inspections of rooms, Christopher says he has to do. Learners love to find things and they'll comment on them. That's a good idea. Marine surveying, okay, okay. Surveying a ship. Well, we have some great ideas. 
Um, I, I mean, I, I think there was some discussion on LinkedIn about this being like, unnecessary, but for so many of these ideas, I think it functionality like this will bring it like way, way further along. I think the, I think the risk is where it's like, oh, this is a, a pretty new feature. Let's just like add this into my like compliance training project. And just like every slide will have a 360 degree image. <laughs> I think we all know not to do that. Um, but yeah. What did Melissa say? <laughs> okay, Melissa, that's that's one approach. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to repeat that one on the stream, but that is funny. Accessibility concerns. Good question, Alicia. I think that's an opportunity for someone to explore. I did notice in the release notes they said it was like accessible. I think we need to test this with the screen reader, though. Um, all right, the recording will be available. I, I, I mean, yeah. What do you all think? I was, I was impressed. Um, let's, let's do a quick poll to wrap this up since we have the feature. Um, can you imagine using this on, or do you think that you will use this on a real project, like within, within the next month, um, or we'll say within the next three months? Let's see how practical this new feature is. And I know we might want to play play around with it, but this is like for you know for a client, for your your company, um, for your audience. Do you think that there's a real use case for this in the foreseeable future? A hundred percent across the board. <laughs> what? That's good. I want to see some of these projects. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Seems like. Um, we're going to be making good use of this feature. And if anyone is going to play around with it and maybe try to do a little escape room of your own or just kind of recreate what we did, share it with us in the Slack. Like, I think a lot of us would love to see what you're working on. Um, I definitely would. So, so yeah, see, see how you can push it um, using these tools. See if you can do anything creative. And we will check it out in the Slack community. And let me just grab a link and share it with you all in case you're not already in there. I think most of us are, but... I'll share a direct link to join, and then I think we will shut this party down. Um, I'm going to try to do a live stream like this every single week. They're not all going to be storyline workshops, but we'll be meeting up every week at the same time if you can make it. Okay. I will see you all soon. We're going to shut down the stream, and I'm looking forward to seeing these 360 e-learning projects. Bye-bye, everybody.